Well, good morning everybody and welcome to another virtual sermon from Livingness Church. We'll just begin our time of worship this morning just by opening up in prayer, should we pray? Father, we just want to come before you and thank you that you are a, grac a gracious and loving God, a God who is full of grace. And as we come to you now, Lord, we just want you to, to fill us, to be in this meeting. Though we are meeting in homes, though we aren't meeting together, we pray that you would fill us with your Holy Spirit. Father, we, we pray that this meeting would be drenched with you, full of you. We pray that uh, throughout everything that happens in this service, you would be present and you would receive all of the glory because all glory is due to you. Amen. Well, we're going to be carrying on with our morning series, which is examining the book of Colossians. But uh, I'm going to ask um, Jess to come and read. And she's going to read from Ephesians chapter 5. Ephesians chapter 5, starting at verse 22 until the end of the chapter. And Ephesians 5 really acts as a uh, quite a similar parallel to Colossians. So uh, Jess is going to come and read Ephesians 5. And then I'll read Colossians later on in the service. So the readings from Ephesians chapter 5 and starting at verse 22. Wives, submit to your own husbands as to the Lord. For the husband is the head of the wife, even as Christ is the head of the church, his body and is himself its saviour. Now, as the church submits to Christ, so also wives should submit in everything to their husbands. Husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her, that he might sanctify her, having cleansed her by the, water, by the washing of water with the word, so that he might present the church to himself in splendour, without spot or wrinkle, or any such thing, that she might be holy and without blemish. In the same way, husbands should love their wives as their own bodies. He who loves his wife loves himself. For no one has ever hated his own flesh, but nourishes and cherishes it, just as Christ does the church, because we are members of his body. Therefore, a man shall leave his father and mother and hold fast to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. This mystery is profound, and I am saying that it refers to Christ and the church. However, let each of you love his wife as himself, and let the wife see that she respects her husband. Well, as we... Uh... Looked at there, there's certainly a lot to cover in uh, both that passage and the passage in Colossians. But as always, it's, uh, it's always futile, isn't it, to come and to seek to study God, to seek to think about things of him without first asking that he would speak, lift us up and encourage us. So as always, we're going to pray and we're going to pray for the church. We're going to pray for you members who... Uh, want to be gathering with us but can't. We'll pray for our, the friends of the church and those associated with us. But we'll also pray as well that as we come to the word of God, God would speak, lift up, encourage us. For when God speaks, powerful things happen. When I speak, not much happens. But when God speaks, there is power, there is anointing. Shall we pray for that power and that anointing this evening, uh, this morning? Shall we pray? Father, we thank you that there is nothing that can keep your people away from dwelling in your presence. We thank you that this Sunday morning as we wake up, we can gather and still sing songs to you, read about you, pray to you. We thank you that you are a God who is ever present to us. We thank you for the great reality 
that though we are um, still limited in who we can see, we thank you that our God is always with us. Even throughout all of the lockdown restrictions, our God has always been with us. We thank you that you have never left us, never abandoned us, never forsaked us, never walked out on us. We thank you that you remain faithful, good and just. And we just thank you now for all of the times over the past few weeks where we have perhaps felt lonely or just distant or isolated. And we thank you for those times when we could go to you, run to the ever open arms of God. We thank you for how good you've been, how faithful you have been. We thank you how you have remembered us. That the God of the whole universe cares about us, thinks about us, remembers us. Oh, we thank you for your great faithfulness. We thank you for every promise you have ever, met, ever made, you have kept or will keep. We thank you that there is not a promise that you have ever broken, nor will there be a promise that you break. We thank you that you are completely dependable, completely reliable. We thank you that we can cast all of our anxieties on you because you care for us. Oh Lord, you are such a, a faithful God, our ever-present source of help. As the psalmist writes, I look to the hills and where does my help come from? We thank you, Lord, that my help comes from the Lord. My strength, my help, it comes from you. In my most difficult time, in my greatest need, we thank you that there is help available from you. And we know this reality because when I was in my sin, when I was doing things wrong, when I was uh, sinning, when I was acting out against you, you loved me enough to send Jesus. When I was rebelling against you, when I wasn't following your commands or precepts, you still sent Jesus Christ to die for my sins. Oh, what a faithful God we have. And we do pray now, Lord, as we, we come to your, your word, as we come to scripture, as we seek to read and as we seek your message for our lives. That's what we want. We pray, Lord, that you will deliver and that you will give your message for the people watching this video. For whoever is watching this video, we pray that you might have a message for them, an encouragement for them. Lift us up in you. Build us up in the things of God. Father, we don't want to be focused on this world. We don't want to be focused on what we can see or touch, but we want to be focused on Jesus Christ. Bless us, Lord. As we come to this passage, I pray that you will be with me as I seek to faithfully open up your word. As we approach difficult topics tonight, I pray that you would be present. We pray, Lord, that this morning you would be a God speaking in power. Oh, Lord, we pray to you, the great God who gives more than we can ever understand. Speak to us this morning. Speak to us. As we open up your word, as we read about you, speak. So that we might never be the same again. Amen. If you've got your Bibles, we'll be continuing, continuing through Colossians. And we're now on Colossians 3. Colossians 3. I'm going to read from verse 18 until verse 25. Colossians 18 to 25. It says this. Wives, submit to your husbands, as it is fitting in the Lord. Husbands, love your wives, and do not be harsh with them. Children, 
Obey your parents in everything, for this pleases the Lord. Fathers, do not provoke your children, lest they become discouraged. Bond servants, obey in everything those who are your earthly masters, not by the way of eye service, as people pleases, but with a sincerity of heart, fearing the Lord. Whatever you do, work heartily as for the Lord and not for men, knowing that from the Lord you will receive the inheritance as your reward. You are serving the Lord Jesus Christ. For the wrongdoer will be paid back for the wrong he has done. And there is no partiality. Well, this is the passage that we're coming and looking at this morning. And as a way of introduction, I just want to address the reality of this passage in the context and the day in which we are in. And the majority of people, when they come to a passage like this, when they read a passage like this, Many will come to the conclusion, or many will be told, that the Bible, quite simply, is anti-women, pro-child abuse, and pro-slavery. When people come to a passage like this, many people will say that the Bible is anti-women, pro-child abuse, and pro-slavery. And we cannot ignore that that is the prevailing view. That is the most popular view. If you asked people in the street to go through these passages and to explain what they mean, many of them would look very unfavourably on these passages. But I want us to look at these verses and come to the conclusion and see what God's plan is and what God's order is for society. And my hope is that we will see that this view of God's or of the Bible being anti-women, pro-child abuse, pro-slavery is inaccurate. That is not what these verses are saying. This is not what these verses are vindicating or advocating. And when I started writing this sermon, I wanted to cover the entirety of these few verses. When I first sat down at my uh, computer to write the sermon, I wanted to, to do a sermon on marriage, on parenting, and on work. So three quite small topics as you can imagine. However because of the sheer complexities of this passage it's meant that I've had to divide this passage across two sermons. And so this first week we're going to look at how God should be in every element of your life. That's something that runs through this entire passage from verse 18 until verse 25. That God should be in every element of our lives. The way that we do marriage should be focused around what God wants. The way that we work should be focused around God. The way we bring up our children should be focused around God. For we submit to a greater and higher authority, a much more loving authority than we could ever be. And in all things we submit to God. In everything we do, in everything we do, we should be entirely consumed by our understanding and love for our God. And throughout the sermon, we're going to be examining and looking at what is a truly biblical marriage. What does it mean to be married? What does it mean for a Christian marriage? What does it mean? To, to live in this countercultural way. What do these verses truly mean? We're going to explore a lot about marriage, about the difficulty and the challenging, and I understand that there might be many people for various reasons. There might be many people watching this sermon who might not be married. And this sermon might be uh, you know, a little bit different or a little bit strange. But for those of you who aren't married, I want to encourage you that the sermon I preach is hopefully still going to be incredibly relevant. 
As we look at what scripture says, not just about husband and wife, but we're going to look at what scripture says about man and God. And the final, uh, the final point of this sermon, we're going to be looking at the, uh, the structures of marriage and we're going to look at those who aren't married and what the sermon means for those who aren't married. So whether you're married, whether you're not married, this is a sermon that will hopefully be helpful and relevant to you as you grapple to understand who you are in light of our great and mighty God. Well, that's enough of, enough of an introduction. I'm going to start with uh, verse 18. My first point is submission. Verse 18 says, Wives, submit to your husbands as is fitting in the Lord. Now, already I know that there will be many people who are at minimum rolling their eyes and tutting. Or at maximum, there are many people who are angry that such a thing is in the Bible. How dare women submit to men? I very much believe that we need to cover this verse in conjunction with the next. And so to understand what the Bible is really saying about submission, we need to take it uh, in the context of verse 19. But I've got a few things just to add before we uh, look at the entirety of this, because you can't look at one verse without the other. But I just want to look at this idea of, of submission. And so often in our society, submission is seen as being a negative thing. So often we are taught about wanting more, wanting to be bigger and better and greater. But here there's almost a description of a, a willful coming alongside in support for the husband. And that marriage working together as the two people come together with mutual support for each other. Later in the sermon we're going to address some of the dangers and abuses within marriage of, of submission. When this word has been taken, in my view, in an unbiblical way. And it's been used to justify horrendous abuses. We will come on and look at that. And how that is not the biblical intention of this. But submission and service are not automatically. Submission and service are not intrinsically bad or negative. But in many things and in many ways, they can be a beautiful thing. Our example in all things should be Jesus Christ. Jesus should be our example in everything. And who was Jesus? Jesus was the servant king. Jesus was the ruler of everything. The Lord of eternity. The Lord of eternity. And Jesus submitted himself to being beaten and nailed to the cross. Something that is so obvious, but it's, it's only just hit me in, a, in a, such a, a real way. It's such an obvious idea, but when Jesus came to earth, when Jesus became a man, that would have been the first time that God had experienced physical pain. Think about that for the moment. Think about that. The first time Jesus experienced physical pain. The first time that Jesus cut his finger or fell over as a toddler when he was learning to walk. That would have been the first time that the almighty God physically felt pain. For God is above pain, is he not? Nothing can hurt or harm God. But Jesus, humbling himself came down to earth, he could experience and feel pain. And as he willingly, in submission and service, went to the cross, what pain he must have felt. What pain Christ would have experienced. What horrors awaited him on the cross. 
But on the cross, Christ experienced physical pain being intertwined with spiritual pain. There was a physical weight of sin and the spiritual weight of sin. At the cross, Christ died for my sin. The centre of our Christian faith, the most important event in our Christian faith, the most beautiful happening of the entirety of Scripture is Christ's self-sacrificial submission. And yet our society advocates getting more and more. And this idea of submission is often portrayed as a negative. The death of Christ is so countercultural. This is a great victory for the whole of humanity and it was brought about by a humbling and obedience from Jesus Christ to his Father. I also want to draw our attention very quickly that this verse says in verse 18, wives submit to your husbands. This verse by no means is saying that all women are submissive to men. This verse isn't uh, building up a, a patriarchal society where men are more valuable or worth more than women. Many take this verse and use it to mean exactly that. That the life of a woman is less valuable, less valid than a man. That is absolutely not what scripture is saying. In here, a woman is to come alongside and submit to her husband. Women are not beneath men in the entirety of society. Men are not lower. Uh, women are not lower than men and men are not lower than women. In God's order for society, the worth and the value is the same. For when Christ died on the cross, he died on the cross the exact same way for men and for women. The other thing is that in our Western cultures, we choose, don't we? We choose who we marry. And in that sense, that there is a huge choice that women have. The choice of who to marry. The choice of who to trust. The choice of who to spend the rest of your life with. And really, this should make anybody who's uh, considering getting married think really hard and deeply about the person you're going to marry. Think really hard about the person you're going to marry and ensure that your marriage is God-centred. Many of us would rather a life when we are first, but that's not what marriage is. In marriage, in God's de uh, design for marriage, in God's plan for marriage, God is first and then the other person is before you. That's what marriage is. Such a deep, affectionate, caring love for the other person. Not something to be ended into lightly, but something to be deeply thought about. And the end of the verse I want to touch upon, for it is fitting for the Lord. There's an element that in honour and love for Jesus Christ, we should do things. Why do we do the things that we do? We should do it out of a complete love and dedication and commitment to Jesus Christ. Interestingly, it doesn't say, do this because it's better for the man. Do this and it will be easier for the man. It doesn't say that. It says, do this for it's fitting for God. God should be the primary benefit in the entirety of our marriage. Our marriage should be about God, about mutual growth and working together in the structure that God hath ordained, working together to glorify God. My first point is submission. My second point is sacrificial. We cannot look at verse 18 without the context of verse 19. Verse 19 says, Husbands, love your wives and do not be harsh with them. Do not be harsh with them. 
There have been countless examples of husbands using verse 18 to abuse their wives. And we cannot ignore this as Christians. We cannot escape it. The reality is some people take the Bible and use it for bad justifications. The Bible is not anti-women, but some men are anti-women. And this verse has been plucked out of the context of scriptures and it has been used to coerce or to justify terrible abuses, whether that be physical abuse, sexual abuse, emotional abuse, financial abuse. This verse, or verse 18, has been taken and used to justify horrific things that the Bible has never and will never advocate. And let me give a very serious warning to anybody who takes the word submission to mean blind following or almost a sense of slavery. Anyone who takes the Bible and twists its meaning and the truth in the Bible and perverts it to allow it or to allow them to abuse somebody, God will one day in his righteous judgment look at that person. How dare any of us take the verses of scripture and use it to beat down somebody else, somebody else that we should love above anyone else. We need to think very carefully about the way we look at these verses. But husbands are obligated to love their wives, but not just in a worldly sense. Not just I love you because you make me feel good. I love you because you're so funny and you make a lot of money, so I'm going to love you. I want to quote the verse that uh, was read for us earlier. Ephesians 5 verse 25 picks up on similar themes but goes even further. Ephesians 5 and verse 25 says, Husbands, love your wives as Christ loves the church and gave himself up for her. Husbands are to love their wives as Christ loved the church. And people might say that the Christian position of marriage is outdated, broken, and morally wrong. But I am certain, I am absolutely certain that there is not a woman alive today who would not want to be loved or cared for in this way. What woman would not want to be loved or cared for as Christ loves and cares for his church? There's such a responsibility on the husband, isn't it? To love like Christ loves. To give and to do what Christ does. How did Christ love his church? How does Jesus love the church? Jesus loved the church so much, he gave everything. Jesus gave everything up, including his own life. He gave his own life for the church. There is nothing that Jesus withheld from the church. He gave it all, all that he could possibly give. Christ gave it all because he loves. Romans 5 and verse 8 again expands on this further. But God shows his love for us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. That is how God demonstrates his love. God shows his love for us in that he gave himself for the church. And in some senses, it's so much easier for me to relate to verse 19 than it is for me to relate to verse 18. It's so much easier to relate to verse uh, 19 because I'm, uh, I'm married. Um, I still don't understand how myself, but I am married. And so as a husband, it's so much easier for me to uh, relate to this passage. And it might be because I can relate to verse 19 more than I can re relate to verse 18. That might be the reason why I'm going to be 
more bold and more challenging. And I want to make sure that you are aware that I am going to be very bold in what I say, and I am going to be very challenging in what I say, but I hope what I say is helpfully challenging. But I want to say that it should be a very difficult sermon to listen to. As we explore marriage, for those of us who are married, it should be a very uncomfortable sermon for all of us. And let me tell you, it might be difficult to listen to and it's even harder to preach. But I want to say that husbands, in your marriages, you have failed. That's my bold statement. Husbands, in your marriages, you have failed. Can any of us truly, honestly say that in our marriages we loved our wives with the same type of love, the self-sacrificial love that Christ had for his church? Can you honestly say that every moment of the day you've loved your wife above everything, above yourself, below God, but above yourself? Have you loved your wife in that way? My assumption is no. What a responsibility we have. A love that does not keep anything. A love that shares. A love that gives. In my, in my marriage, my application might be, do I go out again to play a uh, Another game of chess. Do I uh, organise a league match and go and play chess, even though I've been out every other night this week with work? Do I go out and enjoy playing chess, or what do I value more? Do I value more playing the Nimzovich defence, or do I value more spending time with my wife? Christ gave his life for the church. How much have we given? How much love have we shown? How much have we sacrificed and given up to show that Christ-like love to our wives? Challenging, isn't it? What a challenge and difficulty that we have. Some men might say, and, and this might be an argument, some men might, you might hear some people say, I got a bit of a problem in my marriage and my problem in my marriage is my wife isn't very submissive to me. The problem in my marriage is that my wife isn't very submissive. And that's the problem. Really, I want to say, is that the problem? Or maybe the problem is that you're not loving her as Christ loves the church. It's so easy, isn't it, when there's problems in marriages to point to one difficulty or the other. It's always easier to point to something out there than it is to point to something in you. I wonder if the problem in our marriages, if the problem in your marriage is that you are not loving enough. Maybe you're expecting the other person, your other half, to do everything. Maybe you're expecting your other half to build bridges. It's a mutual thing, isn't it? What a love do you have for your other half? The reminder is what a love Christ has loved you with. A love that did not keep anything back for himself. If you're a Christian here tonight, you are loved by such a great love. Let me further say again, I, I might be picking on the men slightly, but let me further say this to husbands. Husbands are accountable for how you spiritually lead your families and your wives and your children. You are responsible for how you lead and that is terrifying. That is terrifying. Have you considered this Sunday morning have you considered the responsibility of your marriage? Have you considered the spiritual significance of your marriage? Have you ever stopped to wonder, is my marriage pleasing in the eyes and the sight of God? 
Is the way that you are behaving as a wife pleasing in the eyes of God? Is the way that you are behaving as a husband pleasing in the eyes of God? Do our marriages reflect well on our Saviour? As we look at wives, we remember that you are submitting to somebody. You are submitting to somebody who is prepared to do anything and everything for you. That's the biblical pattern of marriage. The wives are willing to submit to somebody who is willing to do anything and everything for them. And in this biblical paradigm, in this dynamic of marriage, there is no room for any abuse. There is no room for any abuse. When you take half of one of those verses, there's room for abuse. When you take verse 18 without verse 19, there's room for abuse. When you take verse 19 without verse 18, there's room for abuse. But when you take those two verses together, there cannot be any abuse within marriage. For if a wife is submitting to a man who is willing to do and give everything for his wife, what a beautiful imagery that is of Christ and his church. Is your marriage, I, I speak of myself as well, is my marriage a positive reflection of how Christ loves his bride, which is the church? Or is it a negative example? I'm going to end this section just with my um, a brilliant quote by Matthew Henry. Matthew Henry describes what a a brilliant Christian marriage is. And I, I love this quote, and it's a, a quote I quoted in my groom's speech. And um, personally, I think we should quote, uh, at every wedding, I think there should be a quote by a Puritan. Um, I might not have uh, any Bible backing for that, and most people might disagree. But the Puritans were, believe it or not, highly romantic people. And this is what Matthew Henry says. Matthew Henry says, that the woman was made of a rib out of the side of Adam, not made out of his head to rule over him, nor out of his feet to be trampled upon by him, but out of his side to be equal with him, under his arm to be protected, and near to his heart to be loved. Isn't that lovely? A woman was made out of the rib of the side of Adam, not out of the head to, be rule, to rule over him, nor of the feet to be trampled on by him, but out of his side to be equal with him, under his arm to be protected, and near to his heart to be loved. That is the biblical view of marriage. No room for abuse. We come to our a third point, and that is, Seeking. And I want to address very briefly in closing those who are not married. For those of you who are not married, for those of you who are married to non Christians, whether the model and dynamic of the sermon might be alien or different for you, for those who are suffering with a, a bereavement, or for those of you who are widowed and no longer married. I want this sermon to be applicable to you. And some of you might be seeking to be married. You might be seeking to have this love that we've talked about. To be loved by somebody like Christ loves the church. To have somebody who's willing to work with you and help you. You might be seeking after that. You might be searching for that. As we look, as we look at God's divine plan for marriage, I want to remind you that it is evidently not God's plan for everybody to be married. And not being married doesn't make you any less complete. There might be some people who are single who really need to hear this message. Not being in a relationship, not being married, does not make you any less complete. I think we've got a very unhealthy society. 
We have got a society that says you need somebody. There's a phrase that says, it's a sickening quote, I really don't like it. There's a phrase that says, you complete me. You complete me. I hate it, it's sickening, but it's also blatantly wrong, isn't it? You complete me. That suggests that I am an incomplete person until I met my wife. Let me reassure you that you do not need anyone in this world to complete you. Being single or unmarried does not make you any less human. It doesn't mean that you've experienced anything less in the realms of humanity. For Christ was truly man and truly God. And if being single limits your potential or achievements or fulfillments, then Christ's atonement was not sufficient on the cross. For Christ had to be a man to die on the cross for the sins of men, didn't he? He had to be a person to die on the sins for people. And yet Christ, his entire, the entirety of his life, was single. And so if Christ was single and true, an example of humanity, then you can be single and not lacking in anything. For Christ was not lacking in anything, was he? For if Christ was lacking in any realm or nature of humanity, the cross would be insufficient. But Christ was truly man, truly God. He lived a life without sin, died on the cross for those who believe in him, for those who are trusting in Jesus. Forgiveness is available. For you, forgiveness is available. And if you are single, let me say this to you. What more do you need other than Jesus Christ? You say, I want to be loved by a man like Christ loves the church. Become part of his church. If you trust in Jesus Christ, you will be loved by God in that way that you want another human to love you. You are not incomplete if you are single. Seek not after the love or the affection of men or women. Seek after the love and the affection of Christ. The deepness, the richness. If you have got Jesus, you are not lacking in anything. If you have got Jesus, you are not lacking in anything. You are not missing anything. It can be very difficult in a world that presses home that you need someone. But ultimately, the only person you need is that person called Jesus. That's who you need in your life. And I encourage you to seek before anything else, Christ. Know him more. Love him more. Experience more. Live for him more. Seek Christ. In your marriages, praise God above all things. I urge you to be submissive, to be sacrificial. And to be seeking. Above all things follow him. Even in your singleness. Do the exact same thing. For all of those who are married. Worship God and follow him. For all of those who are single. Worship God and follow him. There's no real difference. You can be loved this morning. By a God who is beyond you. Shall we pray? Father, we thank you for that great hymn that we're going to sing to close this morning. Here is love, vast as the ocean. We thank you, Lord, that there is a love that comes from you that we cannot get from our husbands or wives. We thank you that though we were rebellious, though we were against you, there is a love from you available for all of us. And Father, we do pray that in our marriages, you would be the centre. You would be the thing on our minds and on our lips. We pray that we would be able to seek after you, to rest in you. 
We pray, Lord, that in our marriages they might be God-glorifying marriages. We pray, Lord, for those who are single. We pray in that their singleness, they would be God-glorifying single days. And we thank you, Lord, that for everyone, every single person who knows what you did on the cross, we thank you that there is a love that the world can never match. There is a love that no person can ever match. And we just pray, Lord, that we would be imitators of that. Not just to husbands and wives or to family, but to neighbours, to friends. We pray we might be able to show and exhibit what true, submissive, sacrificial love is. Father, in all things, we pray that people might see us and recognise that the love that we have is a love that comes from above. Amen. Well, as I've already mentioned, we're going to close just by singing this morning, singing that great hymn, Here is Love. In the person of Jesus Christ, here is love.